Rain spiked my face and blurred my vision, and neither the brim of my hat nor the high collar of my coat kept it from running down my neck. I held on to a rail for dear life as the coach lurched and swayed over the rutted track, and I took no solace that the other nine passengers perched perilously across the roof were just as miserable. I bruised my back on the sharp corners of a trunk, and I had to steady myself by locking my feet under other luggage which had been strapped to its sides. The coach was dreadfully overladen and perilously at least top heavy. My shoes had been soaked in soggy mud, and I shivered in the dampness. The journey had been tiring, although we had been gone from Hoban for only two hours. An average of about five miles an hour was to be expected in those conditions, and at least I was not walking to die. Some of the road users stepped aside into the bushes to avoid the mud which splashed around the horses' hoofs from the great wheels. I looked past the driver and saw steam rising from the labouring animals. Their backs were a lustre of sweat and rain, and their odour filled the air. We had not stopped at Whetstone, for the gate had been opened when the keeper heard us coming. Our guard had sounded his distinctive tarantara when three furlongs distant, which gave the gatekeeper at least two minutes to don his cloak. All of us recognised the particular calls of the coaches. The mail coach horned authoritative fanfares, for they had time schedules to uphold. Woe betide their drivers who let a precious minute be lost. We were only riding on a stagecoach which would get to its destination when it could. Water lay in dark pools and puddles, for despite the road having been metalled with blocks some years previously, ruts had been worn through the surface and were full of sludge. We never knew just how deep they were until the wheels sank to their axles. However, the coachman deliberately drove us through the well-worn tracks, for to miss a furrow would have meant that the coach would ride up on one side and probably upturn us. There were ladies trying to maintain some modicum of modesty and bearing beside me. They, likewise, had chosen to pay half fare for the topside ride. Those who could afford to ride inside were being thrown about a claustrophobic cabin. We considered ourselves lucky that we were the outsiders. Despite the rain, there was nothing as exhilarating as that kind of journey. Sometimes the coachman would let me take the reins, and that was a treat for all four horses responding to my left hand. My right hand held the whip, and occasionally I used it to spur the charges ahead. But that day, all I could think about was staying in my place. The coach slowed to cross the tracks as the bulk of a covered wagon appeared ahead. It too was making for Barnet, but its journey was very slow. The wagoner walked beside its train, guiding the leaders along the road. As we passed them, I counted eight heavy horses, linked in pairs, struggling to grip the mud. Each step of their way was laboured as they sank to their fetlocks in the mud-filled ruts. They were caked in layers of filth, and their burden seemed more than the load that they hauled. The wagon probably carried a dozen tons, and I wondered what it was that it transported. Could it have been building materials or foodstuffs? I let the thought fade as the coach returned to its original tracks with much rocking and noise. The springs holding the carriage above the axles were leather and steel, so they screeched loudly as they stretched to their limits. When another coach approached from the other direction, we came to a halt, and the coachman exchanged tidings. It was quite four minutes before ours was reminded of his purpose by a shout from within, and we continued. Each of us gave greetings to the passengers on the opposite vehicle. With much hat-touching and waving of hands, they were delighted to hear that Trafalgar had been won, as we called the good news, across the road. The hamlet was before us, but we had first to negotiate the decline of Prickler's Hill. We passed under Hill House and descended again towards the cottages which lay below the next climb into Barnet. It would have been nightfall before we arrived, but I held an introduction to a Mrs. Scarbody who owned the Queen's Head in Hadley. She would find me a bed for the night if I could afford no other, and I was ready for her hospitality. The coach rolled down into the yard of the Lower Red Lion, where two of our passengers alighted. I helped to throw down their portmanteau and their other luggage. The coachman checked that an additional team was available, and ostlers brought a pair from their stables, already harnessed for attaching to our leaders. The guard shouted out a warning to us to hold on, and the coach, now with six horses, was led out for the procession to Barnet. The train was led by the ostler from the Red Lion, riding astride the front pair, and we proceeded at his pace, which in all honesty was not much slower than the journey we'd so far endured. On my previous visit, no spare teams had been available, 
and the most nimble of the passengers had been made to walk the hill. The incline steepened and the horses strained more than they had in the past 10 miles. They coped well with the climb to Islington and had overcome Highgate Hill without flagging. Their passage through Finchley Common had been a drag and I was full of admiration at this, their final challenge of the day. I wondered just how many teams would be needed to be linked to the wagon, which we'd passed 15 minutes previously. The hill took a few minutes to ascend, but the lights of the town lay ahead of us, and I began to anticipate the hot meal and a glass or two of ale. The tower of the church was silhouetted against the last colours of the evening sky, which had begun to show through the breaking clouds. Slowly, ever so slowly, our coach approached the houses, cottages and inns. Most of their chimneys exuded smoke which hung in the damp, windless air. But the road remained slippery despite the surface of the hill having been prepared in a proper manner and plentiful hay had been strewn to soak up the mud and manure. The bulk of Middle Road divided the road as it widened. Inns and taverns, ale houses and shops were around us. When we reached the brow of the hill, we stopped for spare horses to be unhitched. To those who ride with us to Bigglesway, shouted the coachman, be in the yard of the boar's head at seven of the clock. That's in one half hour, if you please. I glanced at the clock on the church and wondered if it chimed the hours. Thankfully, I was not to be continuing my journey until the morrow. We dismounted, and I watched to see where my fellow passengers retired. The gentlemen from within stretched their legs and walked into the king's head. Moments later, liveried boys ran out to collect their luggage. I nodded farewell to my companions and stepped out into the high street as the coach was led through the arch of the boar's head. I looked around to recall my memories, for it had been a while since I had ventured this way on my journey home to the Midlands, and I intended to spend the evening with acquaintances that I had met on an earlier visit. There was a pennant hanging bedraggled from the mast of the church tower. The stones in its graveyard stood worn and ready to fall, and the few that had toppled were already overgrown with the briars of neglect. The town was old, and the houses were an assortment of design and purpose. Cooking pots within teased my nose with vapours which escaped through open windows. Alleyways seemed to tunnel themselves between the overhanging timbers of adjacent houses. I spied goats tethered amidst sleepy hens in the yard behind. Hearty laughter turned my head to the open door of an alehouse, through which I could see the flames of a hearth adding warmth to its patron's fellowship. It's good to be here again, I remember saying to myself with an air of blissful recollection, and in heady anticipation, stepped out towards Hadley.